my name is Anna Neymar. Um, I am now faculty at SciArc uh, and uh, an architect here in Los Angeles. Um, I have a firm, uh, it's a small business, with my uh, longtime friend, collaborator, um, Andrew Atwood, and we called it First Office. And so we're here um, practicing in LA uh, and um, and, and teaching, yeah. I come from a family of scientists and um, nobody in my family did anything like this before. I think that um, nonetheless, uh, in my family, almost everybody also is an academic. And I realize now, looking back, my father teaches at Rutgers, a school in New Jersey. My sister teaches at UPenn in Pennsylvania. Um, and my mom and my dad met in the university when they were getting their PhDs. My grandmother has a PhD in chemistry. She was a long, 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 long years, many years teaching. So nobody's an architect, but I think everybody's a teacher in the family. Um, when I was in school, I was really attracted to architecture, to the school at Princeton. There was an undergraduate department in Bachelor of Architecture or Bachelor of Arts in Architecture, to be precise, because in the US we have this distinction of professional education in architecture and liberal arts education in architecture. And this was a liberal arts undergraduate degree where we worked mainly through um, history, theory, and design was part of it, but the design part of it really was linked to, um, to research and to writing. So um, I think what attracted me to architecture was that side of it. It was the side of architecture which uh, connects to culture, to people, to history, to the arts. And that's what I thought ar what all architects were. I thought everybody was like that. Um, so I met uh, in my uh, undergraduate, I met uh, my advisor, Edward Eigen and uh, many others uh, who were teaching uh, at the time at Princeton. And I think that um, I realized that it was a very amazing, amazing discipline. Just the richness of the kinds of things that we can do in this particular moment um, in writing about um, architecture is kind of, it's just wonderful. And so that's why, that's why I ended up doing architecture. I, got to Princeton in 1999. So it was the, kind of the end or the kind of high, high point of uh, the kind of critical discourse. And this was the school um, where, you know, there was Liz Diller on the one hand, Peter Eisenman on the other, uh, and then an incredible kind of history theory faculty um, all in between. Um, and um, as you know, this was also the moment in, um, in US history where economy was doing pretty okay. Um, so uh, if you compare, let's say, the internal world of academic architecture with kind of professional spirit, those things were they, almost never in conversation with each other. So to come out of school and to become, and you know, later on I, um, I did a professional master's uh, degree, um, it, it, it was like oil and water. Those things never mixed. And I think that the professional side of architecture was purposefully distinct. And we work very hard now to bring those things back together. And um, in some ways, the project we're kind of sitting here um, on top of the roof of a small house that, um, that I built at Tyark. Um, this is an attempt to bring together the academic side of architecture and the professional side of architecture to say that we don't need to produce distinctions. Um, they seem to be a little bit um, forced and uh, they produce a disconnect between our academic relationship to kind of architecture as a cultural project uh, versus architecture as a actually a professional project. It doesn't make sense to produce the distinction anymore. No, it's, a good, it's a good question, especially for me. Of course, we're in California. Um, I've been here for 10 years, but it's not where I'm from. Um, we, uh, my family originally uh, is from Russia. Um, my dad's side of the family, uh, they're uh, Jewish Ukrainian. 
My mom's um, Russian Orthodox and actually spent a lot of their time in Siberia. Um, so two very different worlds um, coming together and then we moved um, to the US over time, um, came out of Russia in the early 90s. Uh, my father was a Humboldt fellow and so we spent two years in Germany, some time in France, then the Bronx and then New Haven, then Princeton, New Jersey, um, and before coming to Los Angeles. So in some ways it's a little bit difficult to say that any one place I can identify with, but I can, I think I identify more with the kind of political, um, my political history, um, the kind of bringing together of maybe different, uh, different cultural histories of uh, the kind of uh, Jewish history, the Russian history, and um, thinking about it through a kind of political, um, a political question of the 20th century. I think that's what maybe you know, where I find my home, like where I understand um, in a way my current politics today. And you have lived, uh, where is the place that you have lived more and more time? It's actually probably still Russia. I was there for 11 years and I'm here in Los Angeles 10 years, yes. maybe 11. So it's almost the same. The in-between is very uh, muddled. It's like two years in every place. So I think um, I think Russia and Los Angeles, Moscow and Los Angeles. And when do you think there are the main differences between? <laughs> <laughs> the main differences between Moscow and Los Angeles. Have oh. you been in Moscow in the recent time? I went back at some point in 2007, 2006, I think. Um, Moscow is a uh, really in t insane place. Um, I don't know what the differences might be. One is warm, one is cold, one is colorful, one is gray. Um, one has intensity that's spread out and the other one has an intensity that's built in. Um, they're both incredibly rich cities in terms of culture and art and urbanism. And they both have terrible traffic jams. <laughs> I would say uh, they're more similar than we think, probably because of the intensity. Um, the kind of distinctions of poverty on the street and extreme wealth, uh, those are very similar. Um, and then there is a very strong middle class. Keep going, we're going to wait for you yes. to pass. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, I think for sure during my, um, during my education, my thesis advisors um, have been really uh, important in trying to figure out who, just in terms of like how to be in the world a little bit. So I mentioned Edward Eigen. He's uh, an architectural historian at Harvard now, but um, he was my undergraduate advisor at Princeton. And um, he's a wonderful storyteller. He kind of brings together archival research, um, kind of storytelling, and a kind of architectural um, eye to everything that he does. Uh, it's almost like uh, kind of like spinning a tail you know, like Ariadne spinning the web uh, is the way in which I read his, uh, his work, um, but always like extremely beautiful. And then in my master's program, I met uh, Michael Meredith. And in fact, when we were working on thesis, um, I met my partner Andrew Atwood through the thesis group that Michael put together, or we kind of met each other by having selected the same advisor, I guess. Um, so I think working on thesis within a kind of context um, made for that second encounter with somebody who became uh, a collaborator for the next 10 years, which is kind of amazing. Edward also at the time introduced me to Michael Osman, who is now my husband and the father of our two kids. And Michael is an architectural historian here in Los Angeles at UCLA. So 
um, for sure, this is kind of my world. Um, these are my friends um, and my mentors and my um, kind of, I guess, partners. Um, in terms of just people who've influenced me, I, you know, um, or whom I look at, I don't know, whose work. Um, I look at a lot of, um, for sure, I look at a lot of like um, pre-Soviet art. So it's like, <laughs> you know, like I look at Kazimir Malevich and all the Tatlin, you know, all the photographs of people with a kind of futuristic uh, square and triangle on sticks um, in the streets. I look toward a kind of way in which um, abstraction can also have a political um, depth and a kind of emotional depth. So I look toward those writers. Um, and in the kind of, in the local context, I mean, being in LA, it's really amazing here because even here at SIARC, um, my friends and colleagues here, um, people like Mira Henry uh, and Matthew Au, who teach here, um, are very close friends. Um, David Eskenazi um, and um, Andrew Zago, who is also a kind of maybe teaching mentor, um, but also like LA in general, you know, um, Frank Gehry's work, hugely influential. Venturi Scott Brown, when Denise Scott Brown taught classes at UCLA and brought her students to Las Vegas and all of the studios surrounding that work have become kind of emblematic in my mind of how Los Angeles could be Ed Rocher's like photographic landscapes. And just like, I think being in LA in itself, the city and its artistic heritage in a way is super influential. So um, that's been also in the back of my mind. Well, you know, uh, I live on the west side. So here downtown where um, Sarek is in the arts district. This is the place where you come to like have a really good time. You can have a nice cocktail. You can have a good, you know, school of architecture. But to really enjoy Los Angeles, you have to go out back to the west side. Um, so uh, on a good day, it's a 25 minute drive. On a bad day, it's like an hour in traffic. But you go back and you're on the beach. Go to the beach every weekend. Uh, go to the pool on the beach with the kids. Go hiking. Uh, so my life is really back and forth between a kind of uh, urban life, teaching and working, and then the life of like total leisure in the mountains and nature and the ocean. Um, and I think that that's, that's why I love being here in LA. You can kind of go from the mountains to the city and in one day. So it's kind of amazing. Today we're here, I mean, um, I was teaching this morning. I teach a class uh, in visual studies and visual representation. Um, so today we spoke about um, the difference between figuration and abstraction and um, maybe a lack of distinction between the two. Um, and this afternoon, a photographer is going to come in, Joshua White, to document the gallery um, of the exhibition that just opened. So I look forward to doing that later today. And then I'll go back, uh, pick up my kids from school, make dinner. There was a PS1 entry that Andrew and I put forward as first office. It was the first time that we took the idea of very simple, shapes, the kind of dolmen stones, and stacked another capstone on top uh, as a kind of proposal. We became finalists, but of course, we lost that year. Um, Do you remember who won that year? Actually, it was a couple of um, Mexican architects, super young guys, like really, really nice, really cute. Um, they did that something that was much more fun. Like our structure was dark and gloomy and cast a really nasty shadow. Their stuff was like full of color. It was like amazing. I would have chosen to go with them too. Bungee cords. They're really nice. Um, I think that um, after that, um, I tried to figure out, like we, we worked a little bit to try to understand how to translate 
the ideas of a kind of very large model, but into something that would be um, a house, a project, you know, something that actually could function in the world. So um, we're starting to design um, houses built on this model. And so what it is, is if you look at dolmens at these megalithic monuments, they're all com constructed out of stones, very large stones that you put together and then kind of cap it. So we're trying to figure out how that would suggest a different kind of uh, a different kind of house. So instead of thinking, oh, I want two bedrooms and one living room, you begin to think through the idea of the stones themselves as a kind of infrastructure for the house. So um, somebody might come and say, I actually want three closets, one kitchen, and a bathroom. And those are things that we usually don't talk about. You know, we we try to hide these things, but in the case of um, thinking through the walls and through the mass, we can actually begin to construct spaces with these walls or with these kind of wall objects. And um, that becomes a kind of idea for prefabrication, for like quick construction, and for actually thinking about um, a kind of house that has a much more open floor plan and uh, maybe has all of the stuff that you actually need instead of last minute saying, oh, this design would really fail if we added another closet. In a way, like we start with all of the stuff that we want to hide and somehow the plan emerges from that. So um, we're working right now on a couple of houses, but um, for the most part, trying to actually find clients and like talk to people. So everything takes a little bit of time and uh, our hope is to, to, build, to start building more. Not in galleries, which is, I mean, it's amazing to work with museums, with galleries, with artists, uh, but we'd like to also work with, with people, with cities. Uh, I don't know if people know what architects do, but um, people, um, I think, are a little bit scared sometimes. What will the architect do? <laughs> yeah, like maybe I don't like it. Um, yeah, architects are kind of, uh, they have a bad reputation, I think, for being selfish, for being um, always uh, over budget, never on time, uh, you know, for forcing their aesthetic ideas on others. So I think that um, people have a good reason to not trust the architects. <laughs> if I were people, I would not trust any architect. Don't trust what the architects say. So I think it has to be like, the relationship with the client, there has to be somebody who is actually um, um, open-minded, excited, like a little bit interested also to learn um, in the process. So more collaborative. And I think that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, in the US, architecture actually is very expensive. Los Angeles, I'm renting an apartment. I can't afford to buy anything here or to build for myself. So um, the people with whom I would have a relationship, they're in a completely different market from my own. And I think that produces um, a kind of inequality in terms of class and in terms of um, just where the money is. So um, it's difficult in that sense. In LA, um, the community is still very divided, dispersed. Uh, everybody kind of keeps to their own class and to their own eco uh, economic class. Um, and architects are, of course, only are friends with architects. So we kind of have to mix it up a little bit more, <laughs> I think. Um, and, um, you know, LA is probably a city where architecture is definitely central to the city. And at the same time, it's, um, it's a little bit complicated because um, it's also the city where Frank Gehry has an amazing office. Actually, we're all fans, you know, it's an amazing place. And at the same time, you realize that it takes a long time to build up expertise, to build up trust. And if you have um, a practicing architect who is 55 years older than you are, 55 years older. He's been practicing for more than five dec decades, more than we have. Why would somebody come to me? Right? Like there's a kind of, um, I think in the US, um, there's a lot of um, emphasis on um, expertise. 
Like if you want to go to a doctor, you're going to go to the doctor who has the most expertise. You're not going to go to some young guy and say, young, young girl, and say like, fix my kidney. I feel like in architecture we can take more risks, but at the same time, nobody wants to take risk when it comes to money. So you're going to put a lot of money in the project, you're going to go with somebody who has a lot of experience. So uh, we, in our society in general, it's hard to um, produce a kind of youth culture, I think, right now. It, maybe this is a good moment. Like, in many ways, we see that um, the youthfulness of like a Bernie Sanders campaign, the youthfulness of a Pete Buttigieg campaign, they're producing a new movement, I think, in the US. But um, it takes time for, I think, certain revolutionary circles to come back and to trust people who are younger, people who are um, intelligent, you know, there is a kind of mistrust uh, for a long time that's built into our society. You know, when I started teaching at SciArc, um, we were, this was the only building that was in this entire neighborhood. It was just a parking lot. There was nothing here. It was all industrial spaces, parking lots, nothing, nothing else. So I think over time, um, it has become an arts district. Um, but there had to be something here, an institution that could actually begin to, um, to build a city around itself. And I'm not saying that Sarek made this by itself, but it was a kind of momentum that built up over time. And I think now it happens to be in the middle of this amazing arts district, but it was here for a long time by itself. So I think that over time and um, with, within the context of all of the galleries and all of the artists who are here. Um, it's definitely becoming an institution that is very visible in Los Angeles. Um, but in terms of architects themselves, honestly, I think it's not architects just by themselves. It's all the artists, all the humanities, all the writers. There's a crisis right now, <laughs> like a total crisis of just um, money and technology, it's tech, not to say that I'm against technology, but the tech and the business of tech as a kind of uh, profession and the way to be in the world that has overcrowded uh, the, the kind of an idea of a cultural project just for humanity in general. So I think that we just um, we need to keep working and we need to make the work um, exciting for all of us before it can become also exciting to everybody else. Yeah, so we have in the US, everything is private. There's no, this is, I mean, you know, if Bernie Sanders becomes our president, my hope is that we can have a little bit of socialism and that we can actually have competitions for young people to do libraries and to do cultural projects and public spaces and that there can be an idea about the public sphere that isn't a private sphere. But we don't have that in the US. Everything is private and it's all neoliberal kind of projects. You have to work with the developer to produce minimum conditions of architecture. And you most likely you're a 60 year old white man if you're doing it. So. Um, uh, I think that this is to come back to your first question where I'm from, you know, I'm, I want, I am in total agreement that the federal government should be smart, it should be big, and it should be socialist, and it should work for the people, and not for money, for the, for the big companies, and I think that that's how we bring culture back to, to the general public. Um, not through the decree of a president who is about to sign the ex executive order uh, to make all uh, architecture beautiful again, which, you know, comes back to a kind of um, classical fascism. Um, that would be really bad. That would be really bad. So I think that we have to trust our experts. We have to, you know, think about how it how it actually affects the, the cities in which we, we, we will live. And we have to empower the architects instead of empowering the uh, developers. Well, I, um, when I was working in 2008, I worked at Johnston Markley. Markley and Sharon Johnston are architects here in Los Angeles. They make really beautiful projects. Um, and 
It was 2008, I think, when I came to LA, 2008, 2009 about. And of course the economy psh, tanked. So I, the architecture community was the first to be, a, like everybody was affected immediately, the housing crisis. And it was also the last one to recover because the last thing that you need is to hire an architect. <laughs> like if you have no money to, you know, hold on to your uh, house, if you have no money to send your kids to school, if you have no money to put gas in your car, you're not going to hire an architect. So we're the last uh, profession, I think, to recover from the crisis. And during the time I started teaching because there was no work, actually, nobody was build building anything. And I was teaching at USC. And I have to say that uh, I just, when you walked in here, I got a text from my very first student was Mark Achari. Mark, after finishing USC, uh, got his master's at Princeton and he's now working and teaching as well. Um, and I think about teaching and my practice in a very similar way that, um, okay, we work on buildings, maybe I teach how to do that as well. Uh, but mostly, I, I think that we're working on a community, on people, with people. And um, a lot of these people um, with whom I teach, with whom I work, they become teachers and they kind of continue the same spirit, I think, of thinking about architecture as a kind of political and aesthetic realm, a cultural realm that we can bring to, um, to the world. I have to say, it might be the same thing. The hardest class I took was about professional practice. Contracts, liability, um, how to build a contractual relationship with a client and how to um, buy insurance for your office and your work, how to insure yourself over my head all I wanted to do was like make some really beautiful drawings <laughs> and models when I was at school and here they're telling me that I have to look very closely at legal language and actually make sense uh, with money and with a kind of legal text what to do so I almost failed I failed it I almost failed it. C minus C minus and then now um, with our first office practice we still have this idea that it's some sort of, you know, small uh, artistic endeavor. But in the end of the day, we're, we have to write contracts and we have to <laughs> make the same liability. Like we take on risk and we do these things and we still don't know how to do it. I don't know. I still struggle to every year I have to file a tax return and I struggle every year how to do these things correctly. You can file corporations. LLCs, DBAs, you have like seven choices for how to file and whom to pay taxes, city tax, state tax, federal tax. In order to have a business in Los Angeles, you basically have to be an incredibly wealthy person to begin with. You have to have like this incredible amount of capital and then, and then you have to basically spend it. <laughs> keep spending it, keep spending it. So I'm, I hope that I can learn to be a better kind of like um, just a more um, practical thinker when it comes to business and legal matters. And that's uh, it's going to take it's going to take years. It's going to take the rest of my life.